Okay, so it seems that I'm going to be preaching a lot longer on marriage than I thought. I've got a couple more sermons. But so the, this uh, next two um, weeks, Kevin's going to be preaching next week. But I think I'll be going over um, what I've entitled marriage advice. So um, hopefully just giving you guys a couple of tips that might help your marriage, give you the right perspective. Um, things that I've found have helped um, my marriage and things that I attribute the success of my marriage to. You know, I really thank God for his word and just thank God, you know, that he gives us um, instruction and direction. So it's with some things we don't have to really guess, you know, he gives us some clear guidance. And, you know, that's the first point I want to make is, you know, and before I, before I get into really the meat of the sermon is, you know, I'm not coming at a, I'm not coming at a point of, you know, I've arrived because obviously I'm not up here pretending that I've got it all together and you know, I'm a perfect father or a perfect husband. So, you know, do I do all these things I'm about to talk about 100% of the time? Of course not. Um, but just some advice that for all of us to try and follow and some tips I think would help. So tip number one, I think, is, you know, have the right perspective. Have the right perspective. The Bible says here in Ephesians uh, 4, verse 23, it says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It says something similar here in Romans 12. Romans 12 says here, I beseech you therefore, brethren. So beseech you, he's like basically uh, begging. Um, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And you know, that's one thing that always points, that always strikes me in that verse. Is it is our reasonable service, isn't it? It's not, it's not unreasonable of God to expect us to serve him with, with our life. I mean, think about what he does for us. The fact that we're even alive, the fact that we even breathe. He's given us salvation. He's given us a home in heaven. Um, he gives us so many things, and I'll talk about you know, something else later on when we, when we talk about love. But it truly is our reasonable service. It's reasonable of God to expect you to gather in a church, to learn about him, to, to learn about his word. It's reasonable of God to expect you to tell others about him and go soul winning and, and invest you know, your life serving him. You know, we think you know, God just wants a little bit of our time. We're like, oh, you know, God's trying to take so much from us. You know, it's reasonable for God to expect all of it, um, not just some of it. Um, number, verse number two, and be not conformed to this, work, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. So, you know, we need to have the right perspective. If we're going to have a successful marriage and we want to have the right sort of marriage that's going to glorify God, we have to have the right perspective of marriage. You know, we have to have the right perspective. And, you know, that's why the Bible talks about renewing your mind. Because when we get saved, you know, sometimes we come with a lot of baggage. We come, along, come on with a lot of wrong ideas things that we've been taught. So renewing, uh, the renewing of your mind is getting the right perspective, right? Rethinking things, reconsidering things that you've been taught, uh, reconsidering things that you've uh, been brought up with, you know, even reconsidering your own experiences. You say you've experienced something and, you know, maybe this worked or maybe this didn't work, but it's renewing all of that, re rethinking it and getting back to the Bible. Uh, even reconsidering your own ideas, because sometimes when you don't have an authority from above, you're just trying to live life as, as you think and things that you've figured out. But something that you've figured out and you think is working might actually be wrong, it might actually not be the right way to do things. So we have to renew our mind and get the right uh, perspective. So we've got to be like the Bereans, right? We've got to get back to a biblical view and everything. You know, the Bereans in Acts 17 says they were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all readiness of mind, but searched the scriptures daily, you know, whether those things were so. So we need to be the same. You know, now we have the new man. We need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and get back to the Bible, make sure that what we do and how we see things is the way that God actually wants us to see things. And, you know, when it comes especially to the topic of marriage, you know, we need to have the right perspective of love. Because there are a lot of ideas out there about what love is um, that are not right. And, you know, in, in the context of marriage, because we can talk about love in a lot of different aspects, but in the context of marriage, you know, you don't want to get 
sucked into this um, sort of Hollywood fairy tale expectations of marriage. You know, because you know sometimes people watch too many movies, or they watch too many dramas and things like that, and they get this Hollywood idea, fairy tale idea of marriage, as though um, you know. You know, what am I talking about? It's, it's when people think, oh, you know, you know, my husband should be, you know, I should be the apple of his eye. I should be the only one that he's thinking about. I should be the most beautiful uh, person in his eyes and, and vice versa. But I think, you know, in a marriage, you just need to be real with each other. You know, you know me and my wife, you know, we, we admit to each other, hey, you know, is, is my wife, I, I think my wife is beautiful, but is she the most beautiful girl in the world? Well, you know, to be honest with you, you know, she's not. And, you know, I'm just being honest. And, and I think anyone who's being honest, you know, we all know that there are a lot, you know, am I the most handsome person there is? No. So we, I think we just got to get real that if we have these Hollywood expectations of our spouse, um, you know, that, that um, it's not going to, if we have too high an expectation, um, it's just not real. And it's just not the sort of, um, you know, grounding you want um, for your marriage. So, you know, we love each other. And, and we care for each other, but you know we're real with each other too. Um, so don't get sucked into these Hollywood fairy tale expectations. If your if your husband or your wife is is not what you've seen in the movies, then uh, don't don't be disappointed. Um, so we want to have the right idea of love. And the first verse I want to show you here is in First John four ten. It says here, "Herein is love." Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. You know, a lot of people accuse God um, foolishly and say, you know, why did God, you know, create us just to worship Him and to love Him? And, and did He do that? Yes, He did. He did create us to worship Him and to love Him. But secondarily, because I think primarily God created us so that he could love us. You know, the Bible says here, here, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. So we have to have the right perspective of love, that love is something that gives. Love is, you know, uh, is a giving thing. It's, it's not self-serving. You know, God created us also so that he could love us. He showed his love to us. You know, Romans 5, 8, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And it's in response to that that we ought to love him. You know, going back to that reasonable um, service. So love is something that we do. You know, it's, it's not just an emotion. It's not what our Hollywood tries to make it out to be, that it's just this, this emotional, hot, zealous, you know, sort of thing. Those things follow on from, from the actions. Uh, let's turn to Second John. Here we see another definition of love. It says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And look at verse 6. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So the Bible defines here love as walking after God's commandments, walking after his commandments, obeying God. So you can't love somebody if you're disobeying God. Right? You can't say, I love you so much that I'm going to disobey God in any area. You, if, you love, if you love somebody, you will always obey God. You will do the right thing. Um, now, I won't turn to 1 Corinthians 13, but I'll turn to... Um, actually, yeah, I will. 1 Corinthians. And let's just read these couple of verses here. These are probably the most famous verses when it comes to love. It uses the word charity here because it's, I believe the Bible here is emphasizing the fact that love is an action. Um, it's not just an emotion. And when we read here in verse 4, it says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. So as we're reading through this, just think of it. These are things that, ch that love does, not what love feels. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. So it's not looking out, love doesn't look out for its own interests, it looks out for the interests of others. Is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, 
when I see easily provoked, to me that speaks of pride, right? You're not proud, so you're not easily upset or easily offended. Thinketh no evil. So it's always thinking the best and giving people the benefit of the doubt. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. There's the, the keeping of the commandments, right? You're not re rejoicing in sin, but you're rejoicing in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So love is uh, an action, isn't it? It's not, a, it's not a feeling. And we know that, you know, like we talked about God. God commendeth his love that he gave his only begotten son. Like John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son. He proved it with actions. It wasn't just words and it wasn't just emotion. So have the right perspective. So we talked about the renewing of your mind. Hey, have the right perspective of love, that love is something that is sacrificial. Love is something that is giving. Love is something that is done to others. It's not something that is self-serving. Have the correct perspective of love. But number three, you know, realize the commitment that you've made. You know, you've made a commitment. You know, don't always think, you know, you don't want to be the, the frame of mind when you're married is trying to look for a way out all the time or trying to find reasons of why to leave your spouse. You need to realize the commitment that you've made. You've made a commitment for life till death. You've, uh, but not only that, you've made a promise to serve, haven't you, in your vows? You've made a promise to serve your wife or to serve your husband. And you've also made a promise to be faithful. And, you know, when I think about marriage, you know, marriage is not always 50-50. You know, the world will tell you that, you know, marriage needs to be 50-50. And yeah, if marriage is 50-50, meaning both parties are doing their part, your marriage is going to be a lot better. So if you want a good marriage, you know, make it 50-50, put in your part. But marriage is not always 50-50. Sometimes marriage is 100-0. You know, where you are giving and giving and giving and not getting anything back. Does that mean that you stop giving? No. You ought to keep giving and keep doing the right thing, keep loving, um, and you will have a good marriage. And, and you're, you're, I believe you know, if, if that's the sort of marriage you have, your spouse will not stay at zero for very long because uh, like the Bible says, if you, do, if you reward uh, evil with good, you'll heap coals of fire on their head. You know, they'll, they'll feel guilty and they'll want to um, repay the, the love that you're showing them. So number one, you know, have the right perspective of, of marriage, you know, have the right perspective of love and, and realize the commitment that you've made. All right, tip number two. Let's turn to Ephesians 5. All right, tip number two is, you know, embrace or don't resist your God-ordained role in the family. And, you know, this is something that, you know, it's not popular in the world today, um, that they're trying to change the role of a husband and a wife, change the role um, of your genders. But, you know, if we don't embrace what God has ordained, I think it can lead to a lot of problems. It can lead to a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, disorder in the family. Um, but let's read in Ephesians 5 uh, what God has for the husband and the wife. Uh, verse 21, it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And I think it's a powerful statement there that the Bible says that the wife should be subject to her husband as the church is subject unto Christ. Now, how is the church subject unto Christ? I mean, in everything, right? Anything that Christ commands the church to do, the church should do it. And that's why it says here in verse 24, it says, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So I believe the Bible is teaching us here that if your husband commands a wife, if a husband commands a wife to do something, if it's not contrary to the word of God, she ought to do it. Right, because it's in everything. So if he tells you to do something, as long as it's not sinful, you have an obligation to obey him. But what's the flip side? In verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle 
or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then um, verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So if we embrace um, the God-ordained roles that God has given us in marriage, that the man should be you know, the, the loving leader to protect and to provide, the woman as the submissive helper, you know, support and nurture the children. You're going to have unity in your family. You're going to have one direction. You know, you're going to have one goal. You're going to have um, one final authority. And you know, we, need to trust, we need to trust that God knows what's best for us. You know, sometimes we get this attitude with God like children do. Like, you know, you know, sometimes we have this attitude with God like, oh, you know, God just doesn't want me to have fun. And, you know, believers will often accuse God of that. Well, they say God has all these rules in place because God doesn't want me to have any fun. God's just trying to put it like poo-poo on my parade. But, you know, God loves us and we need to trust that God has um, best intentions for us. And, you know, God doesn't give us commandments because they're bad for us, because he wants us not to have fun. He gives us commandments because they're better for us. You know, the Bible talks about the, the commandments are ordained for life, um, not, not for death. It's just that we aren't able to keep them all. And, you know, it's funny that, you know, the Bible, you know, if you think about it, the Bible was written, you know, how many, thousand, how many hundreds of years ago? And, you know, people have this frame of mind that, um, you know, that th this whole women's live movement is something new of trying to get women out of the home, trying to get women, you know, to, to get other people to raise your kids. But it's not, there's nothing new under the sun. The reason why the Bible talks about what women being keepers at home is because hundreds and hundreds of years ago, even at the time of Christ, women were not doing what they should be doing, which is keeping the home and raising their children and letting their husbands go out to work to provide for the family uh, and, and following their God-ordained roles. Now, one thing I want to note here is, you know, it doesn't mean that husbands can't help with the wife's responsibilities. You know, meaning that even though it is the responsibility of a mother and a wife to, you know, cook and clean and take care of the children, us as men shouldn't have the frame of mind that, yes, even though the woman is responsible for it, that it's somehow feminine if you help out with those chores. Because I know in a lot of cultures, for example, um, they have, they have this mindset that if a man changes a diaper, that he's somehow more feminine. Whereas, you know, I don't believe that is a right way to look at it because it means that you're not going to help your wife when she needs help around the house. And if you're going to want a lot of children, you're going to have to change some diapers. You're going to have to wash some clothes sometimes or hang out some clothes. You're going to have to help with the cooking. So if we have this frame of mind that somehow it's macho not to help your wife, I, I personally think you're less of a man if you don't help your wife and help her um, you know, especially if she's going to be, she's pregnant and she needs help, um, you need to help your wife uh, do those things because um, she's not going to be able to do it all on her own. You guys, you guys have to be a team. So, you know, just because the wife is responsible for the home doesn't mean that the husband shouldn't help out. It's just that the wife is um, accountable if the, the, the home is not in order. And, you know, I've come, to, I've come to the conclusion, you know, when I think about, you know, the wife staying at home and the husband going out and working. Because, you know, some people will say, well, what, what difference does it make? If, what if the wife can make more money and, and go out and work? Why can't the husband stay at home and, you know, cook and clean and look after the kids? And, you know, I, I thought about it and I think, you know, if, if you only have a couple of kids or you only have one kid, then I suppose it could work, right? Like, if you've got one kid and that kid is grown up, and now you want to switch roles, and, you want, and, and the husband stays at home, and the wife goes out and work, could you make that work? You could, right? Like if the woman made more money, and you switched roles, and she did the, the role of a man. But you know, when I thought about this, I, I think the reason why God doesn't have it that way is because it, it limits, uh, I haven't really thought about how to explain this, but I think the reason why God doesn't have it that way is because if women go out and work and men stay at home, it's going to limit the amount of children you can have. 
Because if a woman is having a lot of children, she's not going to be able to hold a day job, right? Because you're going to be, I mean, even with my wife, I don't know if you saw that blog post that I did, but my wife, if you were to count up the amount of months that Elizabeth has been pregnant, right? Compared to the amount of months she hasn't been pregnant, she's been more pregnant than she has not been pregnant. I mean, how is she meant to hold a job to provide for the family as well as raise the children and be pregnant more than 50% of the time? Because women will say, well, that's what maternity leave is for, right? Maternity leave is there so that a woman can have children and she can still work. To be honest, I don't even think, you know, businesses should be forced to provide maternity leave. I mean, it's not fair for a business to hire a woman and if she gets pregnant, pay her salary for six months just because she's got pregnant. I mean, but the only reason why these laws are in place is because women are voting it in and women think they have a right to a job even though like, they have children. That's why maternity leave, I, I, I'm, I'm against. It, sh it shouldn't be happening. If a business wants to do that, that's, that's their prerogative, right? If they can afford maternity leave in order to hire women that want maternity leave, that's fine. But that's not why businesses have maternity leave. Mat businesses have maternity leave and paternity leave now because they're forced to do it by the government. Um, and it's not right to do. And you know, if a woman, if we didn't have, and to be honest, I think if a business had maternity leave, and most businesses do, if somebody like my wife had a job with that company, I'm sure that they would find a way to try and make her redundant because they wouldn't want to keep paying out maternity leave every year after year after year after year and, and, and have her keep her job. So it just doesn't work. So when this is, this is the conclusion I've come to is, you know, the reason why Satan wants to change the roles is number one, it's going to prevent how many children you can have because you can't have a lot of children if the wife is out working. She's not going to progress very far in her career if every two years she has to take off, you know, uh, uh, 12 months to raise children. Um, and also it then means that your children are going to be put in daycare or your children are going to be put in school um, and you're not going to be raising your kids and training your kids as God would want you to do. So... You know, this is why we need to embrace these roles because, you know, if we want to have a successful marriage, we want to have a successful family, you know, remember, we start a family to raise godly children and to raise a lot of godly children. And, you know, I think there's nothing that Satan hates more than us mighty men, you know, making some more arrows, right? If, if you know, if we're making some more arrows, I'm sure that's something that Satan is going to try and stop. But somebody might ask the question, you know, when we talk about roles, well, why should, they say, well, why should the man be in charge and why not the woman? But then you can ask the question, well, why should the woman be in charge? Right? Like, if you're going to ask the question, why should man be in charge, I mean, then you can equally ask, well, why should the woman be in charge? So that's why we need to have an authority that comes from outside of us. Because if, it just, if, if, if we're deciding who's in charge in the family, just based on our own opinions, then we'll never come to an agreement. Because then it's just majority rules, right? Or whoever uh, you know, can, can out, outwit the other, uh, other partner. But it, you know, thank God for the Bible that we, we have an order. We have authority from above that sets in order the authority in a family and then we have peace and order in a family because when it comes to making tough decisions, when it comes to making decisions in a family, we have an authority structure that we can appeal to and that we can follow that comes from something uh, outside, of, um, outside of ourselves. And again, that comes back to the question of you know, what is the source of truth? You know, when we talked about last week, you know, why is homosexuality wrong? Why is certain sins wrong? Well, why is the husband in charge? It just comes back to, well, that's what the Bible says. But we can understand why um, God has uh, men in charge. So if family authority doesn't come from the Bible, then whose opinion should overrule the other? You know, we have peace and order. But we learn from the Bible that women are more emotional, aren't they? And they're more easily swayed by emotion. It, it is a generalization, but that is the nature of women. And I believe God wants stability in a family. He wants stability, you know, doctrinally, philosophically, um, and men are more inclined to be able to hold those positions uh, more stable. So the Bible says here that the husband is the head of the wife. And I talked about, you know, the husband being the head in everything. So obviously in Romans 13, the Bible says that we submit, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. And that's why if your husband commands you to do something that is contrary to the Bible, then you have an obligation to obey God rather than men. 
But if your husband commands you to do something that is not contrary to the Bible, then you have an obligation to obey God and be subject unto your husband. Now, that doesn't mean you can't voice your opposition, right? Or you can't voice your opinion. And I think husbands, if we're going to be a loving leader, we need to listen to our followers, don't we? We need to listen to people that are subject to us. Like politicians, they should listen to the people that they're leading. So it doesn't mean that you know, your opinion is not respected, your opinion is not wanted, that your opinion doesn't matter. But I think what it does also mean is that you don't always need to give your opinion, right? Because if you're always giving your opinion, then um, sometimes you, it, it will cause a lot of strife in your family. Sometimes you want to just, you know, if you know that your husband has thought about it and that he has decided on something, then you can keep the peace in the family and just obey him and do it. I want to show you a couple of these verses in Proverbs. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but I find them um, a bit amusing. Um, Proverbs 27 verse 15. Because one thing you know, I want to say to, to the women in this room <laughs> is, you know, women, should, you should strive to be a wife to your husband and not a mother. Because he already has a mother, doesn't he? And when you marry a man, you're not his authority, you're his wife, aren't you? You have to be subject unto him. Um, you know, uh, a man, you know, if he's left his father and mother, shouldn't be under the authority of his mother. But, you know, as men, sometimes we're used to being under the authority of our mother and our mother, you know, tells us to do things and sometimes we get in the habit of just blindly, you know, obeying them and doing it. I don't think we, as adults, we have to obey our parents. We should respect our parents. Children should obey their parents. But, you know, as a woman, you should strive to be a, a wife to your hus husband and not a mother to your husband. Look at what the Bible says about... Um, of, about women. It says here in uh, Proverbs 27 verse 15, it says, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. So what do you think of when you see that verse? You probably think of a woman that's, you know, it's nagging her husband, you know, mothering him. And it's like a continual dropping. It's just something that's always there and it's really annoying. Um, and that's what the Bible's saying. It's contention, a contentious woman is like. Uh, look at Proverbs 21 verse 9. Look at this man. It is better to dwell in a corner of a housetop, of the housetop, than with a brawling woman in a wide house. So this this verse is saying here that you would rather live in a very small house um, with a woman that that is not annoying you than with a with a brawling woman and have the biggest mansion and have the biggest house. Um, and I just want to show you this last one, Proverbs 19 in the same chapter. Look at this one. It is better to dwell in the wilderness <laughs> than, than with a contentious and angry woman. So the Bible is saying here, it's better not even, not even to have a house than to dwell with a contentious and an angry woman. So what does that tell you? Don't be a brawling woman. Don't be a contentious and angry woman. Don't be a continual dropping to your husband and you'll have peace and um, order in your home. So women should strive to be a wife and not a mother to their husbands. Now, let, now let's go on to the husbands because I know, you know a lot of people, you know, they're really hard on, on wives. But let's go back. Uh, let's go to first. Sorry. <coughs> so we read, you know, we read in Ephesians 5 that you know, the husband is the head of the wife. But remember it says, husbands love your wives as Christ love the church. So there's the other side of the equation, right? That, um, that the husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church. And what did Christ do for the church? He died for the church, right? He provides for the church. So, you know, like, because, you know, I, I believe that women are property of men. And you might, and people might say, oh, I can't believe you'd say that. I can't believe that women, uh, you'd say that women are property of men. Well, you know, a couple of things to think about. One is, you know, my wife, my wife is happy to, to belong to me. Because she knows that I love her. She knows that I love God. She knows that I have an obligation to God to provide, to protect, to, to look out for her best interests. Right? So she doesn't mind being my belonging. So it's not about, you know, it's, there's not a problem with belonging to somebody. Remember, it's about how you treat them. And this is why I don't have a problem with belonging to God. Because why, why would I want to belong to anyone else? You know, I want to belong to God because He's, he's, he's the greatest that there is. He, has, he knows what's best for me. He loves me. He is going to look out 
um, for my best interests. So, you know, you know what's funny when you, when you talk about um, women being property is, you know, some men would do well if they did treat their wife like their property, right? Because if you think about how some men take care of their property, how they take care of their boats and they take care of their cars and they take care of their, you know, their racing bicycles, you know, that seems to be the new thing, right? Like not bicycles, just men. I don't know, like those of us that work in a corporate environment, how men just spend so much money and time tweaking their bikes and buying little add-ons so that they can ride to work. Um, you know, how much time people spend on their houses. I mean, think about it. If you, if you spend as much time researching on the internet, you know, how to, to be a blessing to your wife as you did that certain part for your car or your bike, you know, your relationship might be a lot better. I mean, if you spend as much time on the weekends, you know, with your car, tinkering with your car as you did with your wife, your relationship would uh, probably be better. So I just think it's, you know, it's, and it's, it's, I don't know if it's ironic. You know, it's ironic that, you know, men get a lot of pleasure from tinkering with these toys and these gadgets and things like that. But if they spent as much time on that gadget or on that toy as they did with their wife, their wife would probably bring them a lot more pleasure. You know, not just in the bedroom, I'm not just talking about that sort of place, but just, you know, be more pleasant to be around and, and, and have, a, have a, a more uh, blessed family and a more blessed environment and not, you know, the, the sort of environment that we were talking about when we looked at those verses in Proverbs. So, you know, some men would do well if they treated their wives as well as they did, you know, some of their belongings and spent as much time with them. But the reason why I'm, I'm turning here to 1 Peter 3, because, you know, even though women can are uh, seen as property of men in the Bible, but you know it, it doesn't mean that they're, they're dehumanized because it's you know it's it's a different type of because you know just like men how they treat you know their cars and their bikes and their things like that. And, you know you can have property that you really care for, that you really love. So it's the sort of property that you love, that you care for, that you have their best interests at heart, that you protect and value, that you're to the point that you're even willing to give your life for. I mean, you're not probably willing to give your life for your car or your boat or for your house. You know, some people maybe. But the Bible's saying here that we ought to treat our wife. So she's not just any type of property, um, but she belongs to the husband nonetheless. Look at what it says here in 1 Peter 3. It says here, Likewise, likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that al they also may be without the word be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on and of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, look, which is in the sight of God of great price. So a woman in the sight of God is of great price and a man ought to view his wife the same. She's an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is of great price price let's read on for after this manner in the old time the holy women also who trusted in god adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands even as sarah obeyed abraham calling him lord whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement and here we go likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So, a couple of things I just want to point out here. You know, the Bible talks about the wife being an ornament, the wife being of great price, the wife being a, a, a weaker vessel. And is she weaker in strength? Well, generally, yes, women are generally weaker in strength. But when you think of the term weaker vessel, think of something that is fragile. Right? How do you treat something that's fragile? You treat it with a lot of respect, right? You're very gentle with it. You know, when you, when you place it down on the table, you know, you, you'd be, you'd, you would be very careful and very graceful with it. That's how we ought to treat our wives. We treat them having a lot of value. Because when people think, oh, my wife's like property, you, you think of property that, you know, like a, like a child's toy, right? Like that's their property. They just throw it and just throw it against the wall and treat it like trash. That's not the sort of property the Bible's saying to treat your wife as. The Bible's saying that she's a, an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. She's a weaker vessel that we need to be careful with, that we value and that we take care of and that we protect and um, look out for. 
So, you know, that's why, you know, instead of, instead of getting our values from the world when we talk about the roles of family, instead of getting them from the world and questioning God, we ought to get our values from the Word, right? And renew our mind, have the right perspective. And, you know, instead of rejecting what God has in the Bible and thinking, oh, you know, it's patriarchal and blah, 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 we should just embrace what God has and then understand why God has it that way, rather than embracing the philosophies of the world and rejecting what God has. So number one, we have the right perspective. Number two, um, embrace your God-ordained role in the family. Um, tip number three. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10. Now marriage is about serving, isn't it? Marriage is about serving. It's not about being served. Um, you know, it's funny because when, when people go into a marriage, you know, and I'm not really talking about dating today, but when, you know, when, when young people date and they're looking for a spouse, what is often the question that you hear? You often hear the question, how do I know if this person is the right person for me? And you know, that's not the wrong, wrong question to ask, but you can, you can ask that question the right way and you can ask that question the wrong way. What do I mean by that? You can ask that question in the wrong way by, by by it being a selfish way, right? Saying, is this person the right person for me? Are they going to fulfill my desires and wants in my life? Are they going to help me get what I want? Are they going to improve my life? Are they going to make my life better? That's not the way we should be asking the question. The way we should be asking the question is, is this person the right person for me? Meaning, is this the person that is going to make me serve God better? Is this the person that's going to, you know, uh, you know like I'm going to grow with? Is this the person that I'm going to be able to help grow? We've got to think of this question in a, in a serving mindset rather than in a self-serving mindset. You know, the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, you know, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So even in, even in our marriage, and in our marriage, we ought to do things to serve God, not even to serve the other person because there's a danger of turning our spouse into an idol, isn't there? Uh, let's turn to, uh, uh, where is it here? First Corinthians 7. So we know the first commandment is, you know, to, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you know, not to have any other gods before me. And, you know, there's a danger to turn your spouse into an idol. So, yes, marriage is about serving, but first and foremost, it's about serving God, isn't it? You'll, you'll serve your spouse better by serving God and then pulling your spouse along for the ride. So it's not just about serving your spouse first and foremost. It's about serving God. But you need to have the mindset that marriage is not about you. You know, it's not about serving you and doing what's best for you. It's about serving others and serving your wife and serving God. Don't turn your spouse into an idol. Um, you know, and because, you know, don't, don't be so busy with family that, that you neglect God, right? Because some people, they get so busy with family, doing stuff for their kids, doing stuff for their wife, that they don't go to church. You know, they don't go soul winning. They don't, they don't take the time to read their Bible, study the Bible, and, and serve God you know, that's wrong. You, you're not loving your family if you're not loving God. Remember we talked about keeping the commandments. You need to make sure that you're serving God. You know, how are you going to encourage your wife and your children to go soul winning and to go to church and to, to study their Bible um, if you're not doing it yourself, right? So we need to make sure that we're serving God and um, it, it, that's, that's going to do more for your wife than just serving her as number one. You know, because there is a danger, there is a danger in marriage to, to turn your spouse into an idol. Uh, it says here in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Uh, there, is also, there is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit. Not that I may cast a snare upon you, 
but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Now, I don't think this verse is teaching that we shouldn't strive to be married because we know in Genesis that the Bible says that it's not good for a man to be alone and God gave us a desire um, that is fulfilled in marriage. But what I do believe this verse is talking about is, yes, I mean, obviously a person who is married has things that they need to care for um, that will take them away from being able to serve God more effectively. So there are pros and cons, but you know, in general, in general, you know, being single is a is a gift that is given by God, because the Bible does talk about you know it's better to marry than to to burn with lust. But this verse does teach us that you know there is a danger that you know when you're busy serving your family that they turn into an idol, and you may not realize that, but sometimes they do. If you're, they're taking up all your time to the point where you're doing li very little for God then you've turned them into an idol. Um, what are some other ways that you know whether you've turned your spouse into an idol? Well, I think it's when you lose your joy. You know, because when we're walking in the spirit, we're always going to have joy. But then if you're serving your spouse and you're starting to realize that you don't have joy, you need to ask yourself the question, you know, am I serving man or am I serving God? Because you're always serving God. You, you should always have that joy. You know, what if they are not repaying back anything? You know, like we talked about, if it's a hundred zero and you're giving and giving and giving and not getting anything back, then you need to ask the question, if you're getting frustrated with your spouse, you know, you're losing your joy, ask yourself the question, are you serving God or are you serving uh, man? Uh, let's turn to Galatians 5. The Bible says here, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, and he used not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So serve each other um, in your marriage. And what does that mean when you serve each other? It means you put them first, right? If you want to have a good marriage, put the other person first. Don't always try and get your way. Don't always try and get what you want. Have a frame of mind where you want what they want. You know, and in one way that me and, my, me and my wife do this, we're always trying to give each other the better portion of food. You know, like if there's, you know, let, I know in some family, it's not really in, 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 in so much in our family, but I remember in my family when I was a kid, everybody, when you, when you order a whole chicken, everybody, there's always, everybody has their favorite parts, right, of what bit of the chicken they want. For me, it's the drumstick and the thigh. I hate breasts, I hate wings. So for me, if I had first pick at a chicken, I would get the drumstick and the thigh. Well, if your wife or your husband likes the drumstick and the thigh, if you want a good marriage, have a serving frame of mind, right? And if, if you know that they would prefer that piece, then offer them that piece. Let them have the piece and you take the not so nice piece that you don't like to, to serve them and to do something nice for them. So that's what it means by serving one another and looking out for one another. If you know that they like something and they have a preference or a choice, you know, let them have it. You know, it's not always about getting your way because if two people are trying to be selfish, you're going to have a lot of strife. But if you're both giving to each other, you're both looking out for each other, that will um, be a good marriage. You know, it might be the better seat, you know, like who gets to sit in the front of the car? I mean, if, obviously if you're driving, you're always going to sit in the front of the car, but you know, maybe you're in, a, in another vehicle. You know, I, I, I like my wife to sit in the front. I want her to have the more comfortable seat. You know, I don't mind being uncomfortable to make her a bit more uncomfortable. But, you know, I'm not always saying it should be in the direction of the wife. The wife should be thinking about the way in the direction of the husband too but my point here is that have the frame of mind to serve your spouse to do what's right for them if you both have that frame of mind you'll have a very good marriage you know it's better you know the bible says more blessed to give than to receive so learn to take pleasure in seeing your wife happy learn to take pleasure in seeing your husband happy and if you're both doing that it's going to be good it's better that you fight over who gets to give Right? Then you're fighting over you know, who gets their way, if you think about it that way. I, I, would, I would rather be having that fight with my wife of, no, you choose the restaurant this time. Well, you choose the restaurant this time, rather than, hey, you, know, you went to that restaurant last time and now it's my turn. So you know, th th this is the frame of mind you want. If you have that frame of mind in a marriage, it'll be a lot better for you. Um, and another thing as well, you know, don't, don't refuse a blessing. You know, if your husband or your wife wants to do something nice for you, embrace it. You know, because some people, they are, they're not, you know, they're good at giving things, but they're not good at receiving things. 
But remember, when you refuse to receive something, you're also robbing the person that wants to bless you with a blessing. Right? It's like if somebody wants to give you something, if you don't receive it with joy and say, you know, thank you for doing that and, and, and appreciating it, you know, you're also robbing them of a blessing. So don't have this sort of fake piety of like, oh, no, no, don't do this for me. I don't deserve it. Blah, blah. Embrace it. Because, it, you know, it's, it's a two-way street, isn't it, marriage? If, if you do something nice for them, you also want the person to enjoy what you're doing for them and, and vice versa. So have this frame of mind of, of service. You know, and part of having this frame of mind of service is focusing more on what you can do differently rather than what on the other person can do differently. Because how many times do you hear in, in you know, relationships, just even relationships, work relationships, friendships, you know, because marriage is no different. Marriage is just a relationship that's a lot more intimate between two people. But how many times do you hear, the pe hear people saying, oh, if only they would do this. If only they would do that. You know, we wouldn't have all these problems if they just didn't do this. But hear, hear what that statement is saying. That statement is, is putting the onus to change on the other party, isn't it? Because they're saying, we would have peace, we would have a better marriage if they would just do something. And if you want to have a good marriage, you have to get away from that frame of mind that it's always their fault. They're always the one that has to change instead of saying, what can I do differently? So focus more on what you can do differently to rectify the situation, what you can do differently to improve your marriage, to improve the situation, rather than what they can do differently. Because you can't change somebody else. So putting the onus on somebody else to change is really, it's foolish. Because if, if you're expecting them to change, you have no control over that. But you do have control over what you can change, what you can do differently. So have this frame of mind of thinking about what you can do differently rather than what your spouse is not doing. You know, ask yourself the question, you know, how do I be the best partner to them? Rather than thinking about how can they be a better partner to me? And don't we often do that when we listen to sermons, right? And you might even be doing that in this sermon today where you'll hear about the role of a wife and the role of a husband and you might be thinking, well, my wife needs to hear this or my partner needs to hear this. You know, we, we do that when we hear sermons, don't we? We apply it to other people. But we shouldn't have that frame of mind. We should be listening to God's word, seeing what the Bible says and applying it to ourselves, and thinking, what can I do differently? How can I be a better spouse or I be what uh, God expects me to do? You know, so it's always simpler um, to put the onus on somebody else to change. And that's why people do it. You know, it's our sinful nature to, to blame somebody else rather than do it. And that's why um, a lot of couples, they have these irre irreconcilable differences because they're not willing to change. You know, they want the other person to change. And the other person's not willing to change. Well, then it's not going to work out, is it? Um, you know, there's this illustration that my dad always gave me. It, it, my, I, I think it was my dad that told me this. And it's just stuck with me my whole life. And he told me this story, you know, having the right frame of mind in a marriage. And he gave me this illustration where, you know, where, you know, if, if you put a cup on the side of the table, right, and somebody walks by, you know, let's say your husband or your wife walks by and knocks it over. You know, a, a frame of mind where it's about the other person making a change, they'll, they'll respond in a way and say, oh, you know, how, how, how uh, clumsy are you, right? How foolish are you that you walk by, you're not watching where you're going and you knocked over the cup. Whereas somebody that has a frame of mind where they are doing something differently, they will look at that situation and say, oh, you know, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, you know, I, I, it was my fault. I put the cup too close to the edge of the table. You know, I should have, you know, finished the water in the cup and, and, and not left it there half, half, um, drank, half drunken. So I'm just, I'm just giving, you a, uh, giving you a situation where you, know, you can see the same situation. It's like, it's like seeing the, half, the glass half full or half empty. You can have the same situation, but you're looking at it differently. You, know, you might have this strife between you know, your partner, but if you look at it differently and you look at it as though, what can I do differently? I think it will give you a much more uh, peaceful marriage. <coughs> Now, let's just cover one more point. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 7. <coughs> so what have we covered so far? So one, have the right perspective. 
You know, number two, embrace um, your God-ordained role in the family. And number three, marriage is about serving, not being served. So have a serving frame of mind. What can you do differently to make your marriage better rather than what the other person can do differently to um, have a better marriage? Um, but number four is physical intimacy. You know, I guess this is, not, is always a touchy topic in church because it is a private thing. But, you know, I, I think we don't hear about it enough in churches because it is a bit of a taboo topic. But, you know, God did create the relationship between a man and a woman. He created it for a reason. And, you know, we ought to have a physical relationship with our husband or our wife because it will actually improve your marriage. Um, look here in verse uh, 1. We'll read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So, you know, I take that verse. That's why I don't think it's right for unmarried couples to, to hug and to touch and to kiss and things like that because it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And you might think in the Bible, well, what about the Bible when it says, oh, you know, holy kiss, you know, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. You know, I honestly think that's, that's men, you know, because it's like, I mean, I don't do that. Um, but, you know, I, I think in some cultures, you know, like Italian culture, even Mexican culture, you know, men will greet each other with a kiss on the cheek, things like that. I don't think it's about kissing women on the cheek because I know in some cultures, you know, even in my wife's culture, you know, men will kiss women on the cheek to greet them and things like that. I personally don't think it's the right thing to do just because the Bible says that it's good for a man not to touch a woman. It's better just to, 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 to refrain from it. Um, but that's just my opinion. You know? Number two, uh, verse two. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So you see here that the whole idea of having a relationship with your wife or with your husband is to avoid adultery, to avoid fornication. And just going back to the topic of service, this is one way that you can serve your husband or your wife is to fulfill that desire that we all have so that they don't, they're not tempted to fornicate, they're not tempted to lust, they're not tempted so much to commit adultery. Look here, verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So see, it's your duty um, as a husband or a wife, to render this due benevolence in the bedroom to your husband or your wife. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So we talked about the role of the husband and wife, you know, the husband having authority over the wife. But when it comes to the issue of a physical relationship with your husband and your wife, you're actually on equal par. You have authority one over the other. So if the husband demands it of the wife, she's obligated to, to serve him in that way. And same with the, the, um, the husband. If the wife demands it of him, she, uh, he is um, obligated to serve her in that way. Verse 5, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not. Or your incontinency see if you deny your husband or your wife physical intimacy you are sinning it says here defraud ye not one the other you are doing them wrong and it's more i guess it's more common amongst women than it is amongst men but you know women who have the frame of mind of you know oh no you know when when uh, obviously your husband is is requesting it of you i believe that is a sin that is wrong to do you should be fulfilling that desire in him because otherwise he might fulfill it somewhere else. You know, you, you, you have the power. You know, men, husband and wives, they have the power to help their husband or their wife in this area not to be tempted to commit fornication and adultery. Now, having a physical relationship with your, with your husband or your wife. Now, one thing we can get gleaned from this, um, this passage is have a physical relation relationship often because it says here in verse 5 defraud ye not one the other except it be with consent so there's the consent right um that you have to, a person has to allow you have to um, be allowed to abstain from having that physical relationship um, with your husband or wife for a time 
that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So the only reason why you really should be abstaining from one another, you shouldn't be using it as blackmail against your, your husband if you've had a strife or things like that. And in fact, you know, sleeping together is one sometimes the best way to settle the strife, right? And, and come back and show your love one to each other. But the only reason why you should be abstaining from this physical relationship is that you're fasting and praying. And you know, you don't fast and pray for months and months and months on end. So that's why you should be coming together frequently, you should be coming together often. And even if you're taking a break from this physical relationship for fasting and prayer, the Bible says it has to be done with consent. So a woman can't fast and pray to abstain from the physical relationship if she doesn't have consent from her husband and neither can a husband fast and pray um, without consent from, from the wife. You know, it's funny this passage, just going back to that mindset of serving because, you know, teenage boys, right? They, or young boys, not even teenage boys, maybe boys in their 20s, any boys really, any unmarried boys, <laughs> they'll, they'll read this passage, right? And I'm sure you guys had the same, same thought when I read this passage. You're kind of like, ah, you know, my wife is going to have to serve me in this area. And, you know, it, it, this is an ungodly way of thinking of it. You know, I'm not saying that this is not, you know, a thought that, that is natural for a man to have. But this is not how we should be thinking of this passage. Because remember, now you're looking at God's word and you're applying it to another party, aren't you? You're, you're looking at God's word and you're thinking, ah, you know, this is what my wife owes to me. This is, this is how my wife is going to be able to serve me. And you're thinking about how this benefits you and serves you. Rather than looking at this passage and seeing that you have a responsibility to your wife and seeing it from a perspective of service and saying, hey, yes, my wife has an obligation to me, but I also have an obligation to my wife. I have an obligation to serve my wife in this area and fulfill her desires and, you know, do that sort of stuff. Um, so I'm just, I'm just saying that, you know, there are two ways that you can think of this passage. You can see it as self-serving, which is what a lot of guys do, um, but you can see it as a way that you can serve your wife. And, it, you know, it might be funny, but, you know, it does happen, guys, that, you, know, that you will be in a situation. It may, may not happen as frequently the other way around because more frequently it's the, the guy that is more driven by his lust and by his desires. So more often than not, you'll probably be in a situation where the husband is demanding it and the wife doesn't want to serve him in that way. But there, there, believe it or not, there are times where your wife will desire that physical intimacy and you don't feel like it. And this is where you need to step up and fulfill your obligation and fulfill that desire that she has. We are commanded by God to do that. So let's just see if I've covered all these points. So have the right attitude about physical intimacy. It's not about fulfilling your desires. It's about fulfilling the desire of your wife or your husband. Um, and you know, you know, Jesus saying it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, it applies in this area as well. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, I think you will enjoy your relationship with your wife a lot more if you have this mindset. You will enjoy the bedroom a lot more if it is about serving. Because that's the thing about having a good marriage. If you have this mindset of serving and doing what is right for your spouse, you'll enjoy everything a lot better. You'll enjoy your time together. Your home will be a lot better. When you go out, it'll be a lot better. When you go on holiday together, it'll be a lot better if you're always looking out for the other person. Um, yeah, I've covered all my points there. All right, so we'll continue, we'll continue next week. So just to recap, so one, what do we say? Have the right perspective on marriage. Have the right perspective on love, that it's a choice. You know, it's not that it's action. It's not just an emotion. Um, you know, embrace the role that God has you to do. Like if, if you're a man, embrace that role and take, take the lead, protect and love. Be willing to die for your wife and a, and a woman. Be subject to your husband and, and you'll have a lot more peaceful and an orderly home. Uh, number three, you know, marriage is, is about serving. So have that mindset to serve. Put them first. Put their preferences first in all areas of your marriage. 
and number four, you have a physical relationship. If you have a physical relationship more often, you have the right mindset, your marriage will be a lot better because that's one way that you can serve one another and please one another and have a, have a good marriage. It's natural. God designed it that way. You know, there's nothing wrong with the bedroom. You know, the Catholic Church has tried to make it taboo and tried to, you know, um, make it a wrong, you know, you know, wrong thing to, to, to enjoy it. But God did it that way for a reason and it's something that a healthy relationship has. And that's why a healthy relationship has a lot of children because that is the natural thing that results from a good relationship with your husband or your wife. All right, so let's end there for now and I'll continue in two weeks and give you guys a few more pointers, a few more thoughts.